Church, being that it is Thanksgiving weekend, I know some, a lot of you guys are going to hopefully eat a lot today, eat, or eat a lot this week, right? You know, it, it's not going to count against your diet. Don't worry. I already talked to God about it. All right, you guys are good. He's going to give you all a pass this week, so no worries. But today, guys, listen, we're going to feast on something, on his word, on true soul food today. And uh, when we talk, I thought it was interesting or that uh, I thought it was a great moment in the spirit of Thanksgiving, as we're looking at everything, to, to look at and let's reflect on the very thing that we're doing and why we do it. All right? You guys, listen, if you've come to church more than once, you already kind of know the deal. Maybe it's been a first time in a long time, but you already know the deal, all right? There's a lot of things that just haven't changed. There's a lot of things that don't change, all right? In the past 2,000 years, as the church gathers together and beyond that, even before that, God's people have regularly done what we are doing today. Looking at his spoken word. So this is a tradition, a something, a habit that we do. And you would figure over how many, let's say much of what's written in here, all right? The newest thing in here is over 2,000 years old. The newest thing in here is over 2,000 years old. And the oldest thing in here, we don't know. At least, at least it's three to maybe 4,000 years old. You don't think at some point we could have like figured something out or, or in all those millennials, we could not have exhausted this and felt like, you know what, guys, I think it's time to move on to another book. Why do we keep on revisiting this same thing week in and week out? I don't know when was the last time you've ever thought about that. When, why do we revisit this over and over and over again? So today we're going to answer this question. Why do we do that? And not just the why, but I want to make sure you're going to walk away with the how. And so when, when we look at this and we say, why do we look at the same book every single week, every single day, some of you guys? I know some, of you, some people have a habit of trying to read through the Bible every single year. Maybe that's going to be a New Year's resolution for you if you've never done it, reading through the Bible every calendar year. Well, if we, to answer the question, why do we keep looking at God's word? Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you ask for advice? Or let me ask another question. Do you ask for advice? Yes or no? Online, do you, I mean, everybody online, do you ask for advice? Yes or no? Guys over here, do you ask for advice? Of course you do. You ask for advice at your job, don't you? You ask your employer, you ask your coworker, hey, I don't know what he's, what am I doing, right? Especially if you're new or if the boss asks you to do something and you're like, I, um, Help, all right, Lifeline, bro, help me out here. We ask for advice all the time at work. We ask advice all the time when it comes to, listen, the number one person you're looking to ask advice from, I know, we all do it, Google, all right, right all the time, right? How many times do you ever type something in? How do I, how do you, what can DIY and then fill in the blank, right? I've, I do it a million times on YouTube, on Google, more on YouTube, right? And, and that's what we do. Why do we constantly look for the advice of others asking questions? The reason why is because, this is common sense, guys. We are asking somebody how to do something that we don't know how to do, right? Just, it's as simple as that. When you ask for advice, relationship advice, financial advice, health advice, diet advice, faith advice, whatever advice you're asking for, you're always asking for advice on somebody who knows more than you do. Number one, right? You're just too ignorant. Don't take that as a negative thing. You're too ignorant of the context. And I'm like, yo, I need to know. What do I do? Or you are incapable. Maybe you just don't know. And so you ask advice from somebody who is not only knowledgeable, but able to maybe help you learn how to do. And we ask for advice for all the same reason, to do something that we can't do on our own. So let's go back to this. Why do we look at the same old book every single week? Because we are asking, not just Google, we're looking to God and saying, Lord, there's things about you, I need to know. There's things in this world, there's things about following you. I am ignorant of, I need to know how to help me. This is why we look and we hold and we cherish this book so much. Because this isn't just like any other book on the best-selling list, anything else that you would see there. This book is more than a what. This book points us to a who. And this is why. And by the way, the, you cannot, you cannot detach the work from the author. It's the same thing. 
God as the author. So this is why we cherish it. And we're going to look at a little bit today why we should read this more than the week that we do, more than just this time. Like you, your, your Bible consumption, guys, should not be just when I crack it open, all right? That's not the deal. In fact, I make sure to preach to y'all every single day so I, you guys can walk away from here knowing how to make your own dishes, knowing how to be able to do this on your own. That's my heart today. And we're going to look at Paul's advice to Timothy when it came to his view and his hold on God's word. And this is going to help us to be, because he wanted Timothy to understand, listen, this is how you become what you can't become on your own. Here's how to do and accomplish what you can't accomplish on your own. You're going to need God and you're going to need his word. And so let's look at Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is where we're looking at today in 2 Timothy. This is considered Paul's final letter, his big farewell address, you can say. This is the last thing that we know that Paul, in his old age, he knows, I'm about to die. My time is coming short, and I know I'm going to be with the Lord soon. And so he looks to Timothy, one of many of his protégés, one, one of the many people that he mentored, and he had this final advice for Timothy. And like saying, if I can give you any advice, Timothy, when it comes to what you have to face, I have run my race. I am now going to pass the baton into your hand so now you can run. And that baton... Some of you guys are holding it. It's right here. It's his word. So let's look at 2 Timothy. We're going to go to chapter 3, and we're going to read a couple of verses today. The first one we're going to do is look at verse 3, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 13. So let's just pause here, because here's a big motivation that he, or, or a warning, actually, that Paul gives his son, spiritual son, Timothy, and a warning you and I need to all heed today. So let's look at uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Everybody have it? Let's read it together. Make sure you got ready to take some notes, guys, because God's going to talk to you guys. You want to make sure to grab it. Verse 13, let's put it on the screen so everybody has it if you don't. Evil people, godless people who don't believe, who don't understand, who refuse to, says evil people and imposters, people who will claim to be Christians, who have the essence of, the language of, the the look of being Christians. Evil people and imposters, what are they going to do? What does he say? They will become worse. Another phrase says they will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So here, before we get the advice, he's trying to paint him a picture. He's like, Timothy, I need you to know something, man. I need you to know that those people who claim to know God's word, those people who are going to speak, who are going to claim to speak on behalf of God, They're going to go from bad to worse. In fact, I'm going to rephrase that a little better. These evil people are going to get better and better and better at twisting God's word. That's what he's going to say. Evil people are going to get better and better and better and better at twisting God's word. That is not a, that has, was happening back then, still today, but it was an interesting thing. He says, listen, I need you to know People who are deceived, who don't understand, they're going to twist the scriptures over and over, and they're just going to get better and better and better and better and better at it. Guys, uh, 2,000 years later, we can see, man, Timothy, uh, not Timothy, Paul, Paul was right on this, how it is so cautious, guys. I mean, I, I wish we had the time to look at church history, but it's amazing every time Every time there was a, a, a variant, you know, little timeline break off of what is going on when it comes to a truth, it always starts with a true-ish statement. And a true-ish statement becomes kind of true, compl- and now you're completely false. I mean, obviously true-ish is not true, but it's so subtle. It's so subtle, and it happens all the time. In fact, Jesus warned in the last days that even the faithful, He says, he was talking about this. Jesus mentioned this, that evil people are going to twist and they're going to get so good, so good at twisting God's word that even the elect, the faithful believers would be deceived in mass. I mean, that's amazing that even Jesus said, yeah, they're going to get duped. It's going to sound right, feel right. It's going to get duped. And we see it a lot right now. I mean, you can see it on both sides of the spectrum. I mean, the way people like to twist scripture, you know, you got people who, you know, they have a political bent, regardless of what it is, and they like to take a scripture, twist it, and get it there, and then get, get move us, and in order to, you know, move the, move the rudder and all this, it happens. 
It happens a lot. I mean, this was last year at church. We, we talked about this. I spent a whole day. Really, it was, it was a weekend. Uh, not a weekend. I'm sorry. Just a couple, three Sundays consecutively. We talked about we talked about the dangers of critical race theory and what that was and how subtle it was and how it went rampant throughout all of the church in America. All of it. And there was some true-ish things that we need to look at and say, listen, there are the, the gospels and, and God's word speaks to how we need to view people regardless of what their class status is, what they look like, wear, talk like, color skin. There's, yes, there's a thing that we need to do and we need to fight for true biblical justice. And I stood here, it's helping you guys understand, and that's not it. This is the way God has declared. But it look, it's so subtle and it felt right. It feels right. And guys, that is one of so many things out there that we just need to be cautious about. And he is warning us here, especially now with the internet, guys. Is there, let's be real, it is impossible to know what's true anymore when it comes to online. Have y'all seen deep fake stuff? Have you seen, you know what deep fake is? All right, if you've seen the latest, the latest uh, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, approving a secular movie, but if you've seen the latest, uh, and what's that movie, bro, we saw? Oh, my gosh. Um, James Bond, all right? That was one. Uh, there was a, another thing that uh, The Rock has a movie I, I saw right now on Netflix. He, when is the other? Right? He's always having a movie. Every other weekend, The Rock has a new movie out. But anyways, deep fake is this technology that you literally can superimpose so you, my voice, my face, my mannerisms over somebody else, and it looks like it's me who did it. So if I did it, baby, it wasn't me. It was, it was somebody else, all right? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Deep, the technology now is getting the CGI and this. It is amazing. Amazing. You can make anybody say and do whatever you want and it looks real. It's going to feel real. I mean, we are living in a world that's like tr the finding what is truth. I mean, it's buried under an amount of information. It's hard to know what's true anymore. It really is. And so see here it's saying, he warned us, it's going to get these people deceivers, and this is, by the way, influenced by demons. What's the, the motive behind them? Demonic doctrines. They're just going to get better and better and better at sounding Christian, feeling godly. And because they're going to get better and better and better at twisting the truth, that's what the next advice comes in, church. And this is the one that I, I need y'all to understand. This is kind of like the, the theme behind what we've been talking about over these last couple of weeks and leading into the rest of this month. If the enemy, if, if those people are going to be twisting and twisting and twisting, getting better and better and better at deceiving people, that's less people that are going to know the gospel, know the truth of Christ. And because they're going to get better, then guess who else has to get better? We do. If people are going to get better and better and better at twisting the truth into a lie, then we need to get better at knowing what the truth is for the sake of those who are being deceived. Y'all hear me on that? We need to get better at knowing the truth because it is getting harder to know it and harder to stand for truth. If you believe in the truth, it's getting harder to stand for it. So look what he says in verse 14 and 15 in response to they're gonna get better at messing it up. So we gotta get better at knowing his word. So look what he says in verse 14 and 15. He says, but as for you, that's them. But as for you, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom for what, guys? Salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The key word that he says there, guys, is continued. Some of you guys might have a different version of it, but that word continued is the key to continue in the truth. So he's saying, listen, you know a lot, buddy. Timothy grew up in, grew up in a faith-believing family. He's one of those, like some of you guys, that you just grew up with, with the binky in one hand and the Bible in another, right? Some, some people have that, right? I mean, uh, you, you, my kids, they grew up on veggie tales and stuff like that. That's, that's what, that was their theme music. You know, my, my kids didn't have baby Einstein. They, what was it, love? It was, it was like a, a, baby Genesis or something. Literally, it was the same baby Einstein music, but it was all like, you know, worship songs. It was crazy. And so, so my kids know that. I know that being a pastor's kid. And that was Timothy. Timothy was that kid. He grew up in this. This is what he knew since he was a baby. He was brought up in God's word. He knew it. And so what is he telling him? Listen, Timothy, you know a lot compared to others. So keep going. Don't settle. Continue. Some of you guys, you've been walking with Jesus for a while. 
Some of you guys have read his word a lot. Some of you guys have studied a lot. And to that, I say, congratulations. To that, I say, good job. Honestly, not sarcastically. Hopefully it's coming off across. Okay, okay. I'm being real. Good. That is a very good thing you've done. Now I'm just going to say, keep going. Don't tap out. Don't stop. This isn't something that was like, you know, and I think I've learned enough. I think I got it. I'm good from here. No. Okay. What's amazing about God's word, guys, is that the further you go in it, the deeper and the wider it goes. There is no end to what we find because this is not just a static book. This is alive because it is God himself who is alive. And so we don't get to the end of this book in the same way we don't get to know a person. And so we ought to continue. He's telling Timothy, continue, continue in it. That word to continue means to dwell, to live, be united. I love this phrase, be united in heart, mind, will, persevere in the truth. My favorite one is remain in force. Look at that. When he says to continue in God's word, he says, remain in force. When you think of that, well, what pops up in your mind? Remaining in force. That is, that is tenacity. That is not, I'm going to read the Bible for today. Thank you, Jesus. Put it down and you move on to what's next. To remain in force is intentionality. It is purpose. This is like, bro, this is like some of y'all on Thanksgiving that you, you got that biscuit and you don't want, you see somebody's fork coming into your plate. I'm like, bro, what you know, what you thinking? You know, that's that. That's that kind of a tenacity, like, this is mine. No, that remain in force. Remain in force when it comes to God's word. That is what he's saying. You got to continue, plow forward, keep going, continue in force. Why? Because in it is the gift. It's wisdom for salvation. Not, it's to understand not only how to be saved, but how to walk in it, how to enjoy it. Remember, who's not taking a day off? Those evildoers, right? Who's not taking a day off? The people who are twisting scriptures. So why should he continue? Because these guys are going to get better at taking something you know and going to turn it around to the point that it's going to make you, uh uh-oh, wait a minute, I don't know if I believe that anymore. And because they're going to get better at it, you have to remain in force because the enemy, oh, they're twisting in force. They're, they're, They're twisting, corrupting in force. And so we need to have that same mentality, same word, by the way, guys, that Jesus used. When Jesus said, dwell, abide in my word, those who know and remain in my word will know the truth and set you free. Anybody ever heard of that quote before? And you shall, you know, now know the truth and it shall set you free, right? You ever heard of that one before? Y'all know Jesus said that? That's Jesus. Some people quote it all the time. They don't even know. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the word he says before it is key. How will you know? If you remain in my word, then you'll know the truth. So this, if you remain and dwell and live and hold and, and you persevere in it, that is how you will know the truth. And the truth will continually, by the way, set you free. It will continually set you free. Same word that Jesus says in John 15, 9, when he says, remain, dwell, continue in my word, and you continue in my love, and you will abide in me and produce much fruit. Same thing. Our, our, our heart, our faith should be defined, guys, by perseverance, remaining in force. We got to continue to learn and continue in what we've learned, but I love did you, did you mention, the, you hear that one thing he seen me mention? Not only remember what you've been taught, but can you remember who taught you, Timothy? Remember who taught you? If you read the beginning of Timothy, guys, you know who t- uh, Paul mentions who taught him. His grandmama. His grandmama taught him. His grandmama was saved. Believer in Christ Jesus. Led her daughter to Christ. And his da- that daughter was Timothy's mom. And Timothy's mom had and was praying for him and teaching him. That is how he grew up, knowing the scriptures because he had a mom and a grandma who was praying and guiding and encouraging. Can, can we pause for a second? If you, if you don't have this, you know, forgive me, you can be this person. But is anybody here, if you have a mom, if you had somebody, a parent, that it's, it didn't start with you, it started with somebody else, can you be, take a minute and just be grateful and praise God for that person in your life right now? That if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be here. If they didn't show and bring you and encourage you and model their faith, you would not be here. I am here I, online. I can't see you, but you know what? I wish I could pay in a camera. I am seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11. Yo, almost everybody. Almost everybody here is at, they're in, in multi-generational groups. You got one parent and their child or somebody, you know, it's a kid or grandkid. They're here today. That's a beautiful thing. Yo, come on. Y'all got to give it up to everybody. Y'all give it up to yourselves. That's amazing. You got it. No, we on this online. I wish. Come on, show us some love online. You guys are doing a beautiful thing. You guys are doing a beautiful thing. Come into church and that's one thing. Modeling it every single day. That's, that's the key. So he is saying, Timothy, can you remember your grandma passed this on? She passed the baton to her daughter. Her daughter passed it on to you. To continue in the truth is to also continue in the legacy. It's to continue in the faith legacy that God has given. Now, some of you guys, maybe it starts with you. And maybe some of you guys have other people. Maybe it wasn't your parent that led you to Christ. It was somebody else. Can you be grateful for that person that who spoke life into you? Listen, I'd say for my family, it started with my dad. My dad was the first one in my family that got saved. And my mom, too, as well. I want to confirm that. I want to make sure. But I think it was my mom, our first to be saved, very one of the first ones to be saved on her side of the family. My dad as well. And from there, it has trickled on into the here. We have now my kids who are hearing the same life-giving news of Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. So to continue in the, the scriptures, guys, is also to continue in the legacy of those who have gone behind us. I like to say, you know, some of you guys have Bibles that have red letters in it, right? The red letters represent Jesus speaking. Not every page in the Bible has red letters, but every page in the Bible is stained red with blood from faithful martyrs, brothers, sisters, young, old, women, men, children who gave their life to preserve pages, paragraphs, even sentences. And the reason why you have this today, guys, a Bible in the hand, you are holding a miracle. Kings and kingdoms have tried to demolish this and they, not, they, they can't even get one period off of this. That's amazing. Why? Because that's God, yo. Look at God right there. That is him. That is him. And so we need to be able to, because they're out there twisting, oh, and, and if you've ever seen the thousands of translations, listen, not every translation out there is a good one. I'm telling you now, there's a lot of y'all, some people got some translations that are a little fishy. And remember, they're getting good at twisting it. We need to make sure we know the truth and to continue in that truth, to continue in what we've learned, continue in that legacy. Why? Well, look what, look what Paul says is the result. If you continue in the truth and if you fight towards this, look what's going to happen. Look at what God's going to do. Can we look at verse 16 and 17? Last two verses of the day. Second Timothy, as he continues on, they're going to get better at twisting it. You better get better at understanding it. Why? Because the better we cherish God's word, that is how we will accomplish God's will. Look at this, guys. Verse 16 and 17. All scriptures, not some of it, not a good portion of it, not the majority of, what does he say, guys? All, all scripture is inspired by God, comes from God. He is the inspiration. He is the author. He is the source. And what is it good for? It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. So that the man of God, the child of God, not just the minister, because he's talking to a pastor here, not just the minister of God, but all children of God may be complete and, complete and equipped for what? Every good work. I'm gonna challenge some of y'all today. Listen, you wanna accomplish God's will for your life, but you don't wanna crack open his word? Good luck. If you want to accomplish God's will, what's your purpose? Look, look, man, there's so many things out there. So many pastors, so many things out there. God's purpose for your life. God's purpose for your life. God's purpose for your life. That's true. It is. And what do you need? The number one thing to accomplish God's purpose for your life? For you to learn to continue. Not for you to ride on the coattails of some pastor or preacher and, and you get his or whatever he's received from God, that's what I'm gonna run with. No, it's to learn you so you can, dis you can be disciplined in knowing, studying, preserving, and having a relationship with God through his word. Guys, this is important. And I want you to understand this thing here. Because if you've ever asked and wondered if the, if the Bible is boring, the Bible is boring. No, you just haven't figured it out yet. I'm sorry, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, well, the Bible is boring. No, it's beautiful. Because do you guys know the words that I've just read today? Though they weren't the original words, because we're reading something that's in English. 
that originally was translated into Greek. It was first written in Greek. Everything in the New Testament was first written in, in, this, uh, in Greek, and later in the New Testament, that was, um, sorry, Old Testament was Hebrew. Do you guys know that we just read the voice of God out loud? You guys know that some of you have just heard God's voice. This isn't just man's wisdom or man's ideas. Now, the authors, their personalities, and certain things came off on this. But guys, what you are holding in the, the Bible, if you have one in your hand, you are holding God's audible word in form. This is God's voice, not just man's wisdom or ideas. It is his voice. And what does his, his voice tell us, right? I know uh, my wife tells a lot of these people a lot. Of, you know, she tells people all the time, oh, I want to hear God's voice. I want to hear God's voice. Crack open your Bible, read out loud. There you go. All right, you can start there. All right, but it's important. Oh, if you want to hear God's voice, that's great. But are you, ready to, are you ready to hear what he has to say? That's the problem. So many people are like, oh, I want to hear God. I want to hear God. No, you want, you want God to tell you what you want to hear. That's the problem. The problem is that you want him to say to you what you want to hear. And when he says something, I'm like, oh, no, devil, not today, devil. Nope. I rebuke you, Satan. Nope, that's not it. Because it does, it's, you know, hidden against that. And because it doesn't agree with you or it's what you want to hear, you think it's the enemy? Warning. Pause. Okay? Because if you want to hear God's voice, I got to prepare you for that. Because you hear what Paul says God's word is? God's voice when he says, it's good for teaching. You know what that is? It's meaning it's, it's good for you to know what you need to know. We talked about advice, right? We go, YouTube, teach me, you know, so-and-so, whatever influencer now, teach me, show me, right? God's word is meant for teaching. And in order to be taught, look at the two things that come next. This is where everybody falls off. Ready? The word rebuke. Y'all catch that word? Rebuke. It's good for teaching and it's good for rebuking. You know what rebuking is? Johnny, you're doing it wrong, okay? That's what that is, all right? It's uh, Susie, you know, you, you know you're wrong for what you just did, all right? That's God's voice. If you read God's voice humbly, you are going to hear something and be shown not only you, because God's word, guys, is something that reads you. You just don't read it. When you read it, it reads you. And so when God's gonna speak and God's gonna show you, you will see things. You will see things in your life. Oh, something is wrong with me, not just with so-and-so, not just with my boss or my husband or my kids. Yo, something's wrong here too. You're going to see it. There's, I got an attitude that's wrong. I, I got a habit that's wrong. I, there's an action that I did that's wrong. Sin is wrong. All of this, you are going to see it. And now why does God want to point out what's wrong? Because he loves you and he wants to tell you the truth. Would you want a doctor if you are dying of cancer, but there's a treatment available to you? Do you want him to tell you, Listen, you're all good. All right, have fun. Enjoy your life. You're going to live for 100 years. Keep going. Do you. Are you, you know, because, oh, no, I don't want her to, I don't want to ruin her day. I don't want her to know, oh, no, you know, I don't want her to have to go through those months of treatments. Let me just tell her what she wants to hear. You're fine. It's okay. No, you, we wouldn't want that. And yes, I know it might be difficult to go through, but would we want to know the truth? Would you want to know the truth if there was a solution, if there was a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes or no? Guys, God knows it well and he knows you well. To know, to read the Bible, to read it is to read it humbly. Ask questions when you read the Bible, but get ready to be questioned. Be ready for your motives and your heart and your actions and your life. Things, church, I'm talking to you too, mainly to y'all. Be ready to be questioned by God himself. Oh God, I'm, my bad, bro. You know, right? I got to fix on that. I gotta, yeah, I know you call God bro sometimes. And so my, you, know, you got to fix that. You got to fix that. You got to fix it. All right. You know what the correct part says next? It's good for teaching, good for you to be a rebuke, but then it's also good for correction, meaning that God, every time God is going to show you something that needs to be fixed, you know what's going to come with it? What to do? What needs to do? What can you do to flip that? What can you do to respond to that? That's what's going to come next. He's not just going to go, oh, listen, you got a problem. Go figure it out. I'll see you. Talk to me when you figured it out. God will not do that. He will show us, rebuke us. Listen, you got to fix that. Here's how you do it. And then the last part, notice it said training. Training for righteousness. That is how to live, how to walk, how to have a right relationship with God. Can you guys see right now? You are not going to get that anywhere. Google's not going to tell you that. Facebook's not going to tell you that. Zuckerberg got his own agenda. All right. YouTube's not going to show you that. 
And you're going to get a lot of people who will give you a lot of advice. It's going to sound Christian, smell Christian, taste Christian, and it's fake. God himself, he knows. He knows what you need. He knows individually what your path is on. And you are not going to be able to be trained and enjoy a right relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with his word. You cannot detach this. There's a lot of Christian authors out there who I've heard said, the Bible is great, but I want more. Yo, that's red flag. Red flag all day. For anyone who says, you know, this is good, but I need more than what's in this. No. Red flag. Because God is enough. He is enough. I'm not telling you not to read other books, but I'm telling you what Spurgeon says. Listen, you can visit other books, but you live here. You live in the Bible. Visit another book, but live here. That is what Timothy says. Continue, well, he was telling Timothy, continue, continue in God's word. And do you notice how, uh, did you see that sequence of training, rebuke, and correcting? And I'm sorry, teaching, rebuke, and correcting, and training. Where does Paul start with? Teaching. And where does he end with? Training. That is the point of God's word. He is to show you what you need to know, who, what you need to know about him so that you can think differently, live differently. That's the point. It is being hearers of the word and doers of the word, hearing the teaching and training into the application. That is what God wants. He wants a relationship with all of us. He wants one. And this is a very important one. You cherish God's word, you're gonna be able to accomplish God's will. You cannot do one without the other. And I'm going to, I love this quote from an old evangelist, Dion Moody. You know what he says? Some of y'all, I don't know if you've wanted to grow in your faith and mature and grow closer to God. Well, Dion Moody said, so few grow because so few study. Few grow because few study. What is he saying? Few don't continue. Few don't continue in God's word. They're good with their little bits. They're good with their snippets and they move on. And once they, they, they don't let God's word dictate their, or influence their life. They let others, they let the news, they let this, they let that. Some of us, listen, I warn y'all, all right, you're letting, you are letting social media, if some, a lot of people, you're letting social media disciple you more than God's word. Some of you guys are letting the mainstream media disciple you more than God's word is discipling you. You got to be careful with that. This is what forms us us. It is him. We can't accomplish his will without his word. And by the way, training, I don't know if you've ever had to train for anything in your life. Some of you guys have had to train physically. Some of you guys have had to do training for work. Doesn't training take time no matter what form and context it is? Guys, training takes time and we are not supposed to do it alone. We do it together. And so I want to challenge you guys. How do you continue to go on? I want you to accomplish God's will for your life. And so because of that, I want you, I want to make sure you know God's word. So let me give you a very basic way of how to read God's word. You need to read God's word with joy. Read God's word with joy. I'm going to give you that acronym, J is for Jesus, O is for others, Y is for you. Okay, read God's word with joy. So when you look at a context like this, let's actually, let's do a quick Bible study. Ready, ready, five minutes, here we go. How can you reread 2 Timothy 13 through 17 by using the joy mentality? First off, start with J, start with J. What does this tell me about Jesus? What does this text tell me about God? What is he saying to me? What, what does it mean? Why? Well, what is, what is it saying? That we need to, we have God's word that gives us for salvation, that we need to be able to understand it in order, you know, understand the teachings in order to be trained for righteousness. What does this tell me about God? I'm going to just tell you what I got out of this as I was looking at God's word and studying this morning. You know what this tells me about God is number one, that God wants us, he wants to be known. He wants you to know him. He wants us to be known and God has preserved his word then and even now so that we can know him. Just process that, guys. He wants you to know him, and he has made it possible for us. He knows. He loves you, and so because he loves you, he's going to rebuke and show you. You know you're wrong on this. I need you to give me that. Forgive that person. Why? Because I want to walk with you. The creator God, the living God, wants you to walk with him. God's affection towards you is putting your affection to him to shame. And it's okay. He loves you. That's the, you, that's the Jesus part of it. And then let's flip to the others. What does this text tell me about others? There's a lot of people out there that are going to twist the scriptures that are going to keep me from knowing God. 
God wants me to know him. And there are people out there that don't want me to know him. There are demons out there that do not want me to walk with God. And so I need to be cautious of what other people are telling me. I need to bring it to God every time I hear somebody say, well, I got a word from God. All right, cool. Let me talk to him first. All right. Because you know what? If God gave you a word, let me go talk to the source. All right. Let's confirm it. Oh, no, she's. Oh, oh, he's. Okay. That's what we need to do. If all right, we need to be careful towards others. And then what about you? You know what? I, I, when I saw this, you know what? I, I, I was getting out of this. It's like, look how much God wants to walk with me and to know and wants me to know him. So then I look at me, the you part. And I started examining. Oh, man. I, I'm, I, I've been cutting corners a little bit in my daily devotional time. My bad, God. I've been just going to the teaching. I've been settling long enough to hear a rebuke or a correction. I'm just kind of going for the teaching and moving on. I had to repent. I said, God, I'm sorry. Help me to focus a little bit more. Help, help me to, to remain and continue a little bit more and not just go for surface level stuff. God, I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you, so help me. And so he was showing me, all right, well, what are things that I need to start putting into practice even more this week? And so guys, look, if you want to read the Bible, you want to get, God, you want to walk, understand, take the teaching and the training, yo, read the Bible with joy and cherish his word. You guys have something not boring in your hands. You have something beautiful. And I saw a quick little video that I thought would help us to be grateful. If we can be thankful for a lot, listen, there's a lot that we can be thankful for this week and this year. But let's be extra thankful for his word like these people in this video. Can we put it up? The past only part of God's word was written. Part of it was not. So when other people came to our church and taught us, if we had that portion in our language, we would read it and understand. But when they taught from a scripture we didn't have translated, our hearts would be heavy. But now we're going to have it from Matthew to Revelation. Our hearts are no longer heavy. They are light. This video shows the Kamali people of Indonesia as they received the first Bible written in their language from New Testament on for the first time. These are the elders of the tribe and the pastors. Listen to this prayer and watch their faces. Oh God, oh God. The plan which you had from the beginning regarding the Kimyas which already existed in your spirit. The month that you had set, the day you had set has come to pass today. Oh, Father, my Father, I promise that you gave Simeon that he would see Jesus Christ and hold him in his arms before he died. I also have been waiting under the same promise, O oh God. You looked at all the different languages and chose which ones would be put into your word. You thought that we should see your word in our language. Today, the day you had chosen to th for this has been fulfilled, it has come to pass. Oh God, today you have placed your word into my hands like you promised, you have placed it here in our land. All for this, oh God, I give you praise.
Look at these older ladies and they will receive the word of God. They will pass it on to their children and grandchildren. Now I will pass it on to mine and they will keep them on the path of righteousness. And once we're gone, our children will pass it on to theirs. All those joyful tears for what? A book? For something better. For they got God's word. Now they don't have to wait for someone else. They could see Jesus' words in their own language. This is, I, I challenged a lot of people today. I texted some of y'all. I was like, hey, bring a Bible. I wanted you to hold one today in your hand if you could. If you could. Look at the joy that, they, that those people had to be able to hold what you are holding. That who knows where you had to go find it. It was buried under another book or, or found somewhere else. What you are holding in your hand is a beautiful thing. This is not boring. This is not. It is the most, one of the most tangible ways that we can hold on to God because these these are not just words. What did Paul say? These are wisdom for salvation. How without God's word, how would we know? How would we know who he is? How would we know what he has done? Someone passed it on to someone that passed it on to someone that eventually got to you and you got to hear there is a God out there and his name is Jesus and he died on the cross for your sins. Why? For the rebuke, because we are all sinners and fallen short of God. But what's the correction? That all who believe in him will be saved. And so that we do. Guys, we need to be, I want you, if, if you can uh, live in, and have a being, you know, grateful for something, turn Thanksgiving into thanks living and be appreciative of this amazing miracle that is God's word. That is God's word. And for some of you, I don't, I don't know, I'm not the only one that got teary-eyed online. I saw you cry. I know I'm not the only teary-eyed because some of, when I was looking at those videos, I remember the first time God's word hit me. When I said, you're a sinner and I love you and I loved you this much, look what I did for you. And I want to challenge, I don't care if you're watching, future person watching, because you never know who ends up watching stuff in the future on this as it lives on YouTube. You want to see joy? Receive God's word into your heart that he, Jesus, the Father, he gave his son so that all who believe, so that none could die and have eternal life in Christ. I don't care who you are, what you've done, what you become, where you're going, who your mama is, and I don't care. I need you to know who your daddy is and his God and what he did for you. I need you to know who your friend is, who your savior is, and his name is Jesus. He's the only one. And if you want to receive joy like that, it's not just so much a book, it's receiving that word in your heart. And church, I want you to be grateful. Hopefully you, hopefully you can see a little bit more the task, the time, the legacy, the sacrifice that so many before us have, have had to do so that you could hear the, even the very words that I said to you today. And I want you to cherish it. Hold on to it. Run with it because guess what? There's somebody running with you. You got to hand this off to. There's somebody out there that's dying that you need to place this into. There's somebody there that if you didn't extend the good news to them, they would die in that condition and not know the joy of Christ. So guys, we read the Bible with joy because we live with joy because of what Jesus has done and who he is. And guys, I want to challenge you. Let's continue. Continue into this. Continue to press in. Continue to study. Continue into God's word, which is how you continue in his love. It's how you continue in his love. And the more we continue in the love of God and the word of God, it will allow us to continue the legacy of our brave brothers and sisters of the faith. Because guys, it's our turn to take this Bible, this baton, and run with it. Run with it and, and present it to an unbelieving world so they can see and come to know an unbelievable God.